All right, welcome everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. We're here live on Whiskey Whistle with some very special guests right from Ireland, from a place called County Town, and that is uh, the fine gentleman from Hinch Distillery. Now, I think uh, everybody's kind of familiar with who I am, uh, Mark Kaufman. I'm living here in Winnipeg in Canada, and I'm so fortunate to have a, a table full of, of Hinch. In fact, it's slightly out of screen, so let me just turn that so you can see all the wonderful Hinch delicacy, delicacies that I have waiting me. Get that set a little bit straighter. Uh, and without further ado, let's talk to the five people from, uh, from Hinch. Uh, let's let's speak to Mr. Aaron Flaherty. Aaron, could you please introduce yourself, sir? How you doing, Mark? Uh, first of all, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, it's uh, slightly later on in the day, so we may have already had a few tipples here <laughs> in Ireland, but uh, I'm Aaron Flaherty, and I'm the head distiller here at Hinch Distillery. So I've been lucky enough to be on board to basically see our distillery site change from what was a green field into what you see behind me here. Wonderful. Uh, taken just a lit, little over uh, a year and a half. And I think obviously we had the, the problem with the pandemic. I think it's been great testament to the guys here that we've finally got the distillery going even through all of that and we're distilling away here. So great to be with you today and great to be with the guys in Canada and hopefully be able to tell you a bit about the story in more detail. Well, it's so awesome to have you and uh, I'm excited to, to hear that, uh, I guess it's since November now, that uh, your stills have been uh, been working hard for you, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. So I, uh, I don't forget when the first spirit came off because lucky enough it was uh, the day after my wedding. So. <laughs> It was uh, November the 8th that we actually had the first distillate of our own come off the stills, beautiful stills behind us. And we were very lucky in that given the delay and issues with COVID, we were still able to lay down all of the liquid in 2020 that we required for our cask program, our Ankiya Dune cask release program. So that was something that we, you know, we pushed really hard uh, normally, you would come into commissioning in quite a light production schedule, but to be fair, when we got the stills going, we just we didn't stop, uh, and we're really pleased with the new make that's that's coming off there. So delighted with that we were able to do that, and then continue on into this year with some new exciting casks that we've been filling the new make into. Wonderful. Uh, just so awesome uh, to, to, to hear all the, the great stories of the beginnings. And you mentioned um, uh, you, you were given a day off for your own wedding. Uh, thank goodness. Congratulations. Yes, I probably have Michael here to thank for that one. Uh, so we, uh, after some consultation, we thought that I'd be on one day off. So uh, yeah, thankfully, Michael and the guys on the, on the, the rest of the management team we're happy enough to get shot of me for one day. Fantastic, that's great. Well, and that's a good segue into uh, the introduction of, uh, of you, sir. So, uh, Michael, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, <clears throat> hello, Mark. Uh, hello, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, no, uh, the rumor's not right. I am not uh, Aaron's glamorous assistant. I'm actually the international sales director. So I look after, uh, the company sales around the world so globally i'll take a fair bit of credit for uh opening up the 20 plus markets that we're now in around the world uh canada actually with uh craftwork we're one of the very first uh export markets that we were with jarka and greg there did a great job coming to the uh, london whiskey live so actually canada was ahead of the states and many of the other markets that we're now in uh we're delighted to be there we just started to make some good inroads. And we recently had one of our whiskies listed with the LCBO. So Canada remains a bit, there's a, there's a great affinity with Canada in this part of the north of Ireland. So for lots, lots of really good reasons. And we think our whiskies will do very well there. And this is why it's a wonderful opportunity for us to present the whiskies, both the core range and some of, as we call them, the outliers, which will be coming all good kind of sexy stuff on the way from our distillery. And, uh, you know, legitimately, it's great for me to be here with Aaron because he makes my job that so, so much more easy and interesting 
uh, bringing these wonderful whiskeys to whiskey consumers around the world. Well, that's just amazing. And uh, uh, now uh, I feel like maybe I should speak to you as Mr. Morris. Is that would be would that be better, or just Michael? What do you prefer? Oh no, it's it's got to be Michael. If you if you ask if you say Mr. Morris, I'll be looking around for my father. <laughs> All right, perfect, uh, wonderful. So um, let's uh, let's maybe just jump in and get started with um, the the small batch, and uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit about. Um, uh, the, uh, the the origins of uh, of your brand. I'd like to hear a little bit about that, and, and I'd like to hear about um, uh, the the fact that uh, that you are uh, unabashedly basically sourcing and, and blending these fantastic, delicious, amazing Irish whiskeys. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, which uh, which is I think uh, really refreshing because I know that there has been some you know whether it's in Canada or in Ireland or wherever. Uh, there's been some some companies that um, kind of pass off a whiskey as their own when it, you know they didn't even make it themselves. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, and we'll talk about. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about maybe it's something like how many how many barrels have you got uh, uh, already stocked away? And I'm wondering if there's a if there's any of these now. I don't know. I don't know how to say the name of that uh, that cask program again. Uh, let me sort. An 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 kiden. So it's Ankeid Dun. Ankeid Dun. And basically that is Irish for the first down. Uh, and down being Dun in, in the sense of county down rather than the opposite of up. So basically what we were, we, we were trying to say that that is the first spirit to come from ourselves. We're very proud to be part of county down region uh, as a strong distilling tradition. Uh, you know, if you look back when, when Irish whiskey really set the bar 100 years ago and so, County Down was at the epicenter of that. And it's great to see now more distilleries coming online in County Down because it's something that particularly here at Hinch Distillery, we're very proud of the ebb and flow of Gaelic people between Scotland and Ireland. And at County Down here, we have, you know, quite a unique spot in that we're you know 20 miles as the crow can fly to scotland itself and there was traditions passed back and forward between the two so a big part of our ethos here at hinch is that yes we are an irish whiskey but we look back and reflect on those traditions that were passed between centuries and certainly myself i started in scotch and you know i have a real idea of where I think our, our spirit should be. And we're trying to basically say that, yes, we may be Irish, we may be triple distilled, but what we expect that new make to be is full of character, really bold, and what people might expect from a typical Scotch double distilled. And we're just trying to break that mold and saying, you know, triple distilled Irish doesn't mean always just a light type spirit. You can really play about with what we've got in here and the equipment that we have to really bring about a change to consumers where Irish whiskey brings much more of a choice to them. And that Ankia Doom program was really, we wanted to reflect that, you know, the character of the spirit coming off really had to be something there that we, that we really wanted. And I, I find it, it really sits in that multi grainy but there's also a lovely black current note off it, and it's yeah got us all really excited. So wow! Uh, so I have, well. I have to ask. These casks still left. So oh, how many are left? Oh, oh well, we 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 had 161 casks. Uh, Greg and York over in Canada were one of our very first customers. So I'll, mm. I'll give them that closely followed by me and then Aaron. But uh, I think we've around of the 161 originals we. And it's the first and only time we'll do it. We've only 40 left. 40 left. Yeah. Uh, I think, um, well, you know, uh, it's a little little known secret that not only do I do I operate this uh, this YouTube channel, but I also uh, I also run the uh, the local w Winnipeg Whiskey Club. Um, I think we might have to maybe have a chat later on about uh, maybe seeing if one of those can uh, be earmarked. Um, we'll talk about that uh, in the future with That's the help cool. of uh, of Greg and Yorka. I think that would be just amazing. Of course, there'd be a long waiting period, right? We'd have to wait about a good five or more years, uh, I guess. 
Yeah, so what, what one thing, obviously Irish whiskey, like scotch also, it has to be three years mature, but we wanted to put something down a little bit further than that, you know. So what we're actually offering up as part of the cask program is five years maturation. Now, if you purchase one of those casks, you can then decide to keep it for as long as you want, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's just a small surcharge on warehousing and it, it, you know, it really is small because I, I know personally, I certainly won't be touching mine for, for many a year yet. So mm. uh, I look forward to that. But yes, you, that, that option is completely available to you where any, anywhere from a five year minimum to what, what you decide or how long you can keep your hands off it. Well, that's really incredible. And as I said, we'll talk about that in the very future. And I'd like to, uh, of course, uh, offer a toast to, to uh, Hinch Distillery for St. Patrick's Day. Cheers, gentlemen. And I apologize. I, I only have one single Tua Irish whiskey glass, and it's it's on loan to a friend in the Winnipeg Whiskey Club. So I'm stuck with my uh, my other whiskey glasses uh, for today, unfortunately. So cheers. Cheers. Slow ship. The first thing that I find with uh, this small batch from Hinch which um, which is this bottling right here, mm -hmm. is that it is um, extremely fresh. And uh, of course, it's got a lightness to it, but there's also some nice toasty uh, toasty oak and caramel that's, that's coming through there as well. Can you maybe just tell me a little bit about, um, uh, about this particular bottling? I see yep. that it's 43% which is fantastic. I think um, uh, a lot of, uh, well, most of the uh, entry, I, sh I shouldn't call that entry level, but most of the uh, the beginning points for Irish and Scotch and Canadian distilleries is 40%. So you beef that up, but I'll let you talk so I can listen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the, the story with the small batch, and when we go through all of the expressions here, uh, I'll just give you a little link as to the thought process behind, because you mentioned earlier that this liquid you see in front of you, we have sourced. And we have no problem in saying that because what we did was we went out and we were very specific in what we were sourcing, because what we want to do at Hinch Distillery here is sort of take you on the journey right through from conception through our new make to our own young single malts and beyond it's not very often you get to do that with a, a whiskey and a brand so that's something that we wanted to be absolutely integral to what we're doing so rather than try and potentially bring something back from a you know yesteryear a brand like that we wanted everything to be hinge but we wanted to be part of the journey and this hinge time collection is is the start so what we did, we source specific uh, spirits, always bearing in mind where this connection would be, what we actually do from the distillery. So what we've got here in a small batch is blended with Now, obviously that's green and malt spirit in there. And we touched on it earlier on there. Yes, it, there is a lightness, but there's that toasty, malty, you know, that, that comes through. And that's because of the high malt content in it. So we've actually went for a 25% malt, 75% green, and this has matured all the next bourbons. So again, the link to that will be that looking at our cask inventory when we lay down our new rake, I would like to think that up to between 75 and 80% of all my new make will go into X bourbons. I'll then look at that remaining 25 to be different casks. Because the other thing we don't want to do is have everything in X bourbons, and then of course. what happens with some Irish brands, is, and then you worry down the line what you put it into. I want some of our new make fully maturing in other casks rather than the X bourbons. But this one is a sort of you know tip of the cap to the fact that those bourbons play such a significant part. And with that, in the spirit, you get those lovely vanilla notes. You get. It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of sweetness there. There's a mm. light toffee, but it is, it's light. It's not like a dark caramel. It's a light toffee and not vanilla. And when you go for the, the taste. It's really delicious. Um, again, very refreshing. 
uh, very fresh. That's the only thing that I can really say with with not necessarily how it tastes, but how it feels is that it feels really fresh. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned 25% malt and 75% grain. Um, obviously, the grain is uh, uh, quite special because it's really uh, adding a lot of, um, uh, I think, a lot of uh, um, that freshness is coming from, I guess, from the, um, uh, the the single grain, pardon me, and then added to that the bourbon. So Yeah, and, and that's it. So even when we are producing our own malt, we will continue blending our own malt with grain. We have a, mm -hmm. you know, we have a really good partner there that produces top quality Irish grain whiskey. And that's what they bring to it. You know, they bring that sweet element. There's an almost citrus element to it. And we're really looking forward to blending that in with our, you know, bold, malty, grainy. So it's almost like a, a rye bread as well that you can get off some of our malt and bring it. Absolutely. So yeah. that's what we're really looking forward to with our own malt. And mm. that's why, you know, we thought this just tied in perfectly uh, to what we would be looking to do in the future with our own spirit. The grain is always source because as you can tell from the stills behind us, we are primarily a single malt distillery. Yeah. Uh, we will of course be able to do the typical Irish uh, pot still, uh, but primarily we'll be a single malt distillery. So that grain will still have to be uh, brought in and blended here on site. Mm -hmm, wonderful. I think that gives you some other opportunities as well, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, I'd like to say a quick hello to some of the people that have been uh, been uh, sort of following along already. We have some of my uh, Whiskey Whistle crew members that have joined in, like uh, Mr. Mr. Al from Whiskey Straight Al and uh, Graham Young, and also um, oh, we uh, know, we know Al. oh you, yes, I believe so. And also um, we have uh, where did he go? Uh, the Whiskey Dictionary has also popped in. And some other long-standing uh, sort of uh, what I would call my inner circle of followers, like uh, Christine uh, Christine Deems, who goes by Christine Daisy here, and she says hello, everyone. Look at all the beautiful copper. I think I'll uh, maybe just uh, put a little bit of a a flag on that one so we can see what she has written. Oh, so yes. I think that's um, it. First of all, I mean it's incredible that I get to spend today with you on St. Patrick's Day, but not only that. Uh, you're actually uh, at the home of uh, your spirit, which I think is uh, really significant that we're on St. Patrick's Day and we're celebrating a, uh, a saint who has been given the rank of, uh, uh, you know, the same as uh, the original 12 uh, followers of, uh, of uh, the man, uh, Jesus. And the spirit not only is uh, with him, but it's also with you in your distillery. So pretty amazing. Not to not to put a biblical uh, spin on it, but it is certainly a uh, major holiday on every uh, liturgical calendar uh, for Catholics and uh, Lutheran and so on and so forth. So uh, anyway, uh, again, happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, well, we, we probably feel quite fitting that you've actually joined us on St. Patrick's Day because we also have the, the deal that, of course, St. Patrick is laid to rest maybe six miles, six miles from the distillery. Oh, that's incredible. So it's probably quite appropriate that on St. Patrick's Day, uh, you're probably here at the distillery that could well be closest to, his, closest, to, yeah. to his final resting place. So yeah, quite, quite appropriate. Amazing. Well, when I come and visit, I will have to sort of uh, maybe um, make pilgrimage to, uh, to the resting site of, uh, is it Padraig in 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 uh, Celt Gaelic? Saint Patrick. I think I think it's Pad Padraig, right? Anyway, <laughs> Padraig would be uh, Padraig would be the Gaelic for Patrick. I see. Yes, yes. Um, anyway, so fantastic stuff. Now, <clears throat> pardon me. I wanted to mention uh, the bourbon casks. Now, you mentioned in your uh, Anke Anke Dun, um, the casks. You use um, Maker's Mark casks. Is that the same uh, for some of your other bourbon expressions like the small batch? So, uh, no, obviously with the uh, small batch and being sourced liquid, those casks, we, we that would have been laid down before we had influence onto the choice there. 
So the maker's mark was specifically our own choice. Yeah. Again, uh, that was all intertwined, if you like, with the, the story of Hinch Distillery here. And I mentioned earlier on that ebb and flow of, of Scots and Irish. So when we really delved in, as I'm sure a lot of your followers know, with the story of bourbon, you know, Ulster, Scott people have quite a big influence within that. And when you look back, one of those such people was uh, uh, William Samuels Sr., uh, who came from Scotland, settled in, in County Down here, and then was one of the first to travel from Derry across to the States, became a distiller, and then his family line basically continued into Maker's Mark. So when we were looking for bourbon casks and a distillery that we really, because we do want to be very particular here, one about the character of the spirit and two about the wood in which we're sourcing. So it just seemed like such a natural fit to go with Maker's Mark. Uh, you know, great quality bourbon and, you know, a great link to both the, themselves and the distillery here in this part of the world. No, it's incredible. Uh, well, that's that's a, a very interesting that uh, that you've got that uh, uh, the history uh, again with with Maker's Mark that links all the way back to uh, uh, to Ireland and um, I personally I think Maker's Mark makes incredible incredible bourbon and I think um, uh, anybody would be lucky to to get their hands on uh, Maker's Mark bourbon casks bourbon barrels. In fact, I, I know as a, for a fact that there are uh, distilleries even in Canada that really want some Maker's Mark bourbon barrels and they just can't get them because it's just too competitive um, and uh, not enough to go around. Um, especially, I, I always hear about the Maker's Mark 46 barrels that um, uh, that are very uh, rare and, and desired. Uh, anyway, so uh, that'll be pretty amazing. And I I mean, I, 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 will, I will be uh, as thrilled as, uh, as the next guy to, to get my hands on uh, on a cask and uh, and see that mature over time, I might have to use some of my uh, my friends to help with that uh, that endeavor. So again, we'll discuss that at, at a later a later time. But uh, let's let's move into your five year old double wood, and I'll pour that one for myself. These are really beautiful bottles, by the way. I love the fact that they're a little bit stout. And uh, they're also not exactly plain. It's actually got your entire uh, beautiful branding on the glass itself. Um, what is this interesting quote on the bottom of the bottles? Uh, it says, uh, what does it say? It says, the, the, whiskey, whiskey, the whiskey that understands time. That understands time. Please explain. I, I want to know how that ended up on the bottle. So uh, Derek Hardy... Uh, marketing director here at Tinch. This was very much his uh, stamp on the original branding. And everyone everyone knows about whiskey that the, the key element is that you have to be patient. You know, there's nothing happen, happens with whiskey quickly. Uh, it is, it matures like, of course, like, like most people mature as well with age. And uh, uh, that's, um, that's something that is applied to whiskey. So we were tapping in, and Derek's idea was that that the whiskey spirit, the whiskey liquid, would mature with time, and and it's it's again, uh, it's just a reference and a nod to the fact that whiskey, uniquely among a lot of spirits, um, gets better with age. And I have to say, um, five years old, and it, it doesn't smell immature whatsoever. I smell just delicious, amazing whiskey that I would really like to uh, to sip, and I will do that right now. Cheers again, gentlemen. Cheers. Cheers. So you mentioned this is double wood. Now, what are the two different woods that are used uh, for this uh, particular expression? Yeah. So, again, the, the story behind the, the five-year-old double wood, uh, a number of things, again, all to tie in with what we're going to be doing ourselves from our own distillery. And, you know, one thing there, we're, we're not afraid to put a five-year-old age statement on there. Uh, you know, the small batch itself is younger again. But what we're thinking there is we don't want to be laying down malt. You make malt here 
and then having to wait 10, 12 years to, to allow people to try it. Now, what we are doing here with the five-year-old is showing that young spirits can actually be, you know, really enjoyable spirits. And again, back to, we want people to taste our spirit right through its lifespan. You know, we want people to be able to taste some of our younger spirits when we make them, and then, of course, enjoy 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 18-year-olds in time to come. So that, that was where the, the thinking on this one was. The double wood came into it then. Again, we're just trying to do something slightly different with the spirit. So what we've done here is a similar blend to the small batch. And where it was matured in the ex bourbons, we then took it out and we put it into uh, virgin American oak for a final year to bring get just to give it something different and to make it a little bit more complex. Now, the thing about the double wood is, and that we're really excited about is, we are even going to look at potentially other woods. So on this occasion, we've gone from the ex bourbons into virgin. But potentially there, we may do another combination. And basically, it's just a double maturation, if you like. It's not where we're keeping it in there for, you know, as long as we can. So it's not just a finish. It's actually adding something to the whole maturation profile. And with this liquid, you'll find, as opposed to the small batch, yes, there is a little bit of that sort of light and honeyed sweetness to it. But the vanilla level, the toffee level, has significantly reduced. And now on the palate, you're getting something completely different. There's a white pepper spice to it there now. And that's obviously lending itself from the from the new wood. So mm. it's really, it's, it's made the spirit quite complex uh, and well-rounded. And again, this was, this was uh, at 43% ABV or the 86 proof. But you don't get that alcohol burn or anything like that coming through. And again, how we how we set the ABV levels of our spirit will totally be dependent on ourselves when we come to sample them, when we come to try them, because we don't want to just set that everything we produce will be at you know a level, because then you're you're actually not doing the, the spirit any any favors and actually tasting and sampling what it's best at. So these were all, you know, there was, a, there was a real specific selection made there and that just came from plenty of tasting. So really pleased how the five-year-olds has turned out. Uh, and again, we, we look forward to bringing out, you know, those younger statements as people know that it's our own spirit coming online. It's, uh, it's really amazing. And I, I get an interesting, I don't know if you have uh, candy apples uh, where you are. But uh, yeah. a, a nice tart apple uh, dipped in a, a red candy glaze, and and you you eat it, and your mouth gets all red. But uh, so I get a really nice candy apple, and then also uh, some very nice sweet mint. And you mentioned pepper, uh, white nice white pepper coming through as well. Quite um, quite lovely uh, lovely whiskey. Yeah, can I also say, Mark, that uh, this whiskey, uh, the five year old in particular which has become a real winner for us in the international scene mm. as is almost getting referenced as a bartender's whiskey, because although this is beautiful um, in the Irish style of sipping it, maybe with a drop of water or not as the case may be, but because of those strong flavors coming through, it's a beautiful whiskey for cocktails. So this whiskey is for instance, going really well in the States and pre COVID this was, was getting a reputation as a, as a bartender's whiskey for mis mixing and classic uh, uh, whiskey-based cocktails. I can see that. Uh, I think that would be uh, ideal because, you know, it's, it's, it's got everything. It's got the, the sweetness that you want in, in cocktails. And it's also got some, uh, some natural tartness. And, uh, you know, um, there's a, uh, uh, a stringency, a, a bitterness, that uh, will survive no matter what kind of, of mix yeah. or what kind of garnish you put in there. And uh, no matter what kind of cocktail you mix, you'll know that it's a, a whiskey cocktail. And I think that um, I think that could become a person's favorite, uh, let's say like a, a Hinch, uh, a Hinch um, Old Fashioned, for example, um, or uh, what's, what's the... 
what's the cocktail? Is it a um, Boulevardier maybe that, that you can mix with uh, uh, with whiskey and not um, uh, not gin? But um, so I think that would be really amazing. And I'm certainly not a, a, a mixologist, so you know, for me, a, a, a nice cocktail is just simply something like that um, uh, that five year old uh, the double wood with uh, an, a little a cube of ice and a little bit of club soda. No garnish, and that's for me. That's ideal for the summer, and I'm going to try that when the weather warms up here. I think that'll be I've great. Done, I've, done that. I've done that, and it works works well. Which one? I'm sorry. The one you were talking about, just with uh, a double soda and ice, yeah. uh, because the whiskey flavor comes through still tremendously mm -hmm. well. It's a very refreshing drink, and and what I like, one of the, the key elements, it's it's dry. It's you know, it's not yes. it's sweet, yeah. it's sweet on the nose, but it's very dry in the drink. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I mean, you must know if you like that that uh, that whiskey and soda, the highball style, uh, they're they're just so drinkable that uh, they're almost dangerous because I will I will go through a couple of those, you know, if it's hot outside within uh, within uh, let's say half an hour, and yeah. there's no turning back from that. <laughs> well, even outside of the cocktails, we actually call the small box of five year old danger whiskeys. Because you open the bottle and it's hard to put it back. <laughs> I think a mint julep would be nice too. Thanks, uh, G Wiz ninety nine J. Awesome. Well, this is exciting. So we've got thirteen people following along, which is a nice crowd for uh, for an afternoon in Canada. And of course, this will live on after the fact, and hopefully, we'll see uh, a little bit of uh, a boost. Maybe I hope I uh, can't uh, say that I can't. Uh, you know, be too proud of myself here, but I think um, hopefully a few extra people in Canada and especially locally, I'm here in Manitoba. We don't have any hints yet. So hopefully some of the, uh, the big wigs at our Manitoba liquor and lotteries uh, see this video and think, Hmm, time to contact Craftwork spirits and get this on the shelves. Let's hope. Let's hope so. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so we Sorry, there was, a, there was a question there I see about the base characteristics of the new make because I sort of touched on it earlier. So I think it was Jason Whiskey Wise there. So just just to let you know, so what we're what we're finding and what we're what we're getting off on the new make, uh, as I say, we wanted to be you know we're a single malt distillery. I want us to sit in that uh, segment, if you like, of the the flavor the flavor profile and the wheel there. And what we're getting is a real multi grainy. It's it's almost like I, I mentioned. It's like a rye sardo. Uh, there's a biscuitiness to it, but then overlaying that, there is this lovely fruit coming in, which is a, a, to me very black currant. Now I've had lots of new makes before, and I get fruit and I get things like that, but I've never got the black currant. And it became really evident we had uh, we actually had visitors on the day we were filling uh, the Ankia Dune cask because obviously it created quite a bit of uh, interest. And basically, when people came in, there was a comment that was made, and it was like, you know, where's the Ribena? Because the the smell throughout the filling store was just incredible. Um, but as I say, that underlying taste is is is, is really about being in that multi strong bold type of, of character that we're looking for um and we've only we've only even started distilling really you know it's it's from november you know we can play with so much as you can see from the stills behind us the way they're designed we can do so much to try and produce a meaty character if we want because the stills are quite quite stout quite small and stout but you see there we have the uh oh I'm pointing that way <laughs> We have the boil bulbs, we have the big shoulders, we have the upward inclined line arm. So really we can play about there with the reflux and all sorts of things to lighten the spirit if we want to. But also if we drive them on, then you know the vapor doesn't have that far to travel if we're driving them on to get that more meaty, nutty character. And as I say, we have no problem in, in trying to do that because you know we don't think there is enough different new make characters out there at the minute in Ireland, and that's why it's great seeing more distilleries come online, more distillers being excited to do something different, because really a lot of innovation should be done in here. Uh, you know, sometimes we think outside, 
of when the spirit's made, how do we be innovative now? But, you know, this is the place that we can play around as well. Mm -hmm, wonderful. Uh, one question I have to ask uh, is, um, so when you are distilling single malt versus single pot still, probably you'll have to, um, uh, let's say, do a week or two weeks of single pot still and then go back to single malt. Um, uh, have you have you done a, some single pot uh, distillation already? No, we haven't done any pot still here at the minute. Now we have the we have the setup there. In uh, yeah. normally in a traditional single malt distillery, you will just have the lighter ton that you bring your grist straight into. But here at Hinch, we have the mash conversion vessel and the lighter ton. Uh, now even with our single malts, we use both. Again, we're hoping that can help us with a lot of you. Know, extract and flavor uh, enhancement but that pot still will probably more be more of a let's say more exclusive uh, yeah. and often that we're looking to do maybe as a special release rather than being a core uh, part of what we're doing here at, at, at Hinch. Main thing will be about uh, single malt. Well, that's that's also um, uh, surprising to hear, and also interesting that that'll be a, a very special, uh, special type of hinge that comes out that says single pot still on it. Now, I noticed that um, you know, I guess in the past I had assumed that single pot still was essentially malted barley plus unmalted barley or green barley, and just those two things alone. But now I see. Uh, having tried a couple of other single pot stills like uh, uh, Drum Shambo, I'm not sure if that's if I'm saying the name correctly, but uh, they use something called Irish Barra Oats. Uh, does that mean you can use any grain in uh, single pot still uh, distillation? Yeah, so the, the, the way that the technical file is set out at the minute, um, trust me, a lot, a lot of distilleries are also challenging the technical file because the, the way that the, the legislation reads it as is that you have to have malted barley and unmalted barley those have to be at a 30 percent minimum level in the mash bill okay so either one of those has to be a minimum of 30 or sorry both of them have to be a minimum of 30 you can play up but 30 is the minimum but then you're only allowed five percent of a n other cereal so that five percent is where you start seeing people bringing in oats and things like that now, as I mentioned earlier, this is something that's probably being challenged by a lot of the distilleries who primarily look after, and well, when I say a lot of the distilleries, probably more of the smaller independents. You know, if you think about, you know, uh, Red Spot, things like that, they're quite, they're quite content with the technical file being as it is. Uh, but other of the smaller ones are looking to bring out mash bills that they found from many years ago, and they're challenging the fact of these proportions um, but as I say, for us, we can sort of sit back, look at look at that one from the outside in, uh, see where it goes. Hopefully, you know, it'd be great to, to, to allow a bit more freedom there for, for some of those stories. But as I say, that would really be just, a, a, a you know, something special that we're looking to do in the future. Because it is, it's uniquely Irish. And, you know, we, we, would, we would want to do some form of spirit to, to appreciate that. Now, I, I jumped ahead and I poured some of the, the Hinch 10-year-old sherry cask finish. So um, this is uh, what I am currently sipping. And great that it's 10 years old. And uh, you now another question that I have. So this is triple distilled. So again, this would tell me that, um, well... If that if that has some single grain in there, then that single grain would, must have also been uh, triple distilled. Is that correct? Yeah. So every everything that would be coming from our partner here in Ireland, that all fits into that 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 bill. Um, you know, because it is it's something again that you majority see is uh, distinctly Irish being triple distilled. So yes, that all plays a part in the columns and the number of times they go through. Now this is, um, I mean, among the three. I mean, of course, this is uh, uh, getting very, very, extremely delicious. But it, it's still got this really amazing, nice astringency that uh, that I think this would also 
do extremely well in, in cocktails. This is lovely. Well, I think what's quite evident about the, you know, the 10 year old sherry that we brought out again, this was all by design. You know, it's not a, it's not a sherry bomb. It's not, you know, mm. sometimes, you know, I, I appreciate sherry finishing on whiskey you know, as much as the next, but sometimes it can overpower the actual whiskey character itself. Whereas I think this just marries quite nicely in the fact that yes, you pick up those typical sherry notes. You know, people think of uh, those sort of stewed fruits and things like that. But there is, you, you know, you still are able to appreciate the other characters and flavor profiles within the spirit. Hmm. No, uh, really, really lovely. And I think, um, um, I mean, obviously, when uh, when your distillate comes of age, it will take on its own identity at that point in time. But, uh, uh, you know, this is really, really nice because it's got such a balance that it's, uh, it's not overly sweet. It's not overly, uh, overly tart or dry or, or savory. It's got really a nice, a nice balance of flavors. And I think um, uh, I know for a fact coming, having, so I lived in, in South Korea for 13 years and uh, this, this would do amazingly um, in Asia, and I'm not sure where in Asia you you have entered as far as markets, but um, this will sell amazingly well just because it's so nicely balanced. I think Michael could probably yeah, give no, me we, a little bit of background on that. Yeah, no, the the uh, the Far East, the, the Asian markets actually have, through COVID have done very well for us. So we're in Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Uh, we've recently entered China itself. So these markets as you've rightly said, have proven very uh, good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the consumer over there is very interested, particularly the affluent kind of 25, 35 year olds coming into whiskey for the first time. They're not just caught up in scotch. They're very interested in what new styles are coming. And, and obviously Irish whiskey, although we in many ways predate scotch uh, before uh, prohibition and so on when Irish whiskey was dominant, but it's about the new world. It's about the fact that there's a great renaissance happening in, in Irish whiskey. Uh, 10 years ago, there were only four distilleries in Ireland. There's now 38. And the reason incredible. for that, yeah, it is incredible. We're, we're number 36, I think, is our proud number. But uh, it, it's clear that the renaissance is happening, not because of the fact that there's no interest. It is a huge appetite for new styles. Um, and, and Irish whiskey is the... In a, in a really weird way, the new kid on the block and lots of interest around the world. And in Asia, that has proven to be very much the case. Now, so here's another thing that I'm curious about, and I haven't really been keeping up with uh, with the, uh, the recent history and let's say uh, changes in any, any sort of legal changes or whatever. But when you think that, um, uh, that these... I guess uh, 34 distilleries have come about in the last decade. Um, and just, just thinking about uh, Canada and its new distilleries and how that all began. And it really came from a change in, in, uh, in legal, legal status and a change in distilling minimums and this and that and the other that really opened the door to, let's call it, uh, craft distilling for, for uh, a better, a lack of a better term. But uh, so was there kind of a, a, a legal change that sort of uh, led the, um, uh, the opening of the door of opportunity for, for new distilleries in Ireland? Well, I, I, th I think the answer is that, uh, and let, let's, let's give credit where it's due. First of all, the biggest Irish whiskey brand in the world, which we all know, uh, opened tons of doors. So, so that brand was suddenly... Uh, competing very aggressively with Scotch everywhere and and was the fastest growing spirit brand in the world for something like seven or eight or more years. And that coincided with Cooley and the seal of Cooley to where I worked. I worked there with John Teeling for six years. Wow. We, yeah, we we built a very successful business there as Ireland's only independent. So, of course, when Cooley was snapped up by Bean, that, that the people were wide awake to the fact, people like Dr. Cross here, the owner of, of our distillery, were, among many other people, were suddenly interested that there was a void 
that the, the independent sector was gone, and yet there was this great appetite, which Cooley had proved. So consequently, it was those two factors, I think, it's as simple as that, meant that people who had the wherewithal and had the, the cash, essentially, you got a lot of bonders who come in and bought uh, many of the, uh, the casks that were available. So that right away got people into the category, but then people with deeper pockets started uh, obviously designing uh, their ideas for their own independent distillery. And, and, and that, that was, uh, lots of people got interested. So even though we're now into the high 30s, there's still, I think, uh, in the record, another 10 or 15 distilleries on the books that are gonna be built. Incredible. Uh, that's, the, you know, again, just, just amazing. Um, so, and it's also very interesting that, uh, uh, that Michael, you have um, experience with, uh, with teeling and uh, I think, I think you've already seen in the background uh, that there's some, some teeling paraphernalia behind my head. Uh, so, and that was kind of the first, uh, the first Irish whiskey that really turned the light on for me uh, was teeling. And then now it happens again uh, with, with you and uh, both of you actually have a similar sort of, of progression. Of course, Teeling had a history of, of distillation, but um, uh, the uh, uh, let's say uh, having to, to source for a while before the whiskey comes of age. And I think it's um, I think it's incredible that uh, that you are basically uh, uh, I don't want to say following in the footsteps. You're, you're following your own path, but uh, obviously it's it's a it's a recipe that works. And I think. Um, uh, I think that um, you know any any stores and uh, distributors would be would be lucky to hurry up and align themselves uh, with you as soon as possible as uh, uh, as uh, uh, Craftwork Spirits has in Canada. So again, uh, cheers to your your current and also your future success. And again, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody that's joined in. Slow chip. And uh, yes, uh, please uh, let's let's all uh, tip our hats to uh, to Greg and uh, Yarko Winters for uh, bringing this incredible whiskey into Canada. So cheers to you guys! Yeah, cheers. And and I will I will uh, endorse everything you said there, Mark. That there, we have no problem. You know, we know the teelings well. Uh, we were to a degree inspired by what they had achieved and what they are achieving, and that's a good model to follow. And uh, Certainly when we, when Dr. Cross, the owner here, uh, put, put the business plan together, starting with buying the casks and then laying down the foundations to a distillery, right up to and including them bringing Aaron on board, a well-regarded person on the way up. Uh, yeah, it's all, all to do with, you know, we, we are not, yes, we're very content to be uh, a member of this dynamic category, but we want to, we want to lead the way ourselves here in the North. And um, I think we're making a good start to that. Fantastic start, absolutely. Now, I want to share uh, a little bit of a, a slide uh, in a moment, but uh, uh, just to, to get back to uh, uh, to you, Aaron, um, you have, uh, certainly you have the um, the academics uh, behind you, I guess for, that was from, I've heard Strathclyde Distiller, uh, pardon me, Strathclyde University in, uh, uh, in Scotland where you studied chemical engineering, but, um, uh, Obviously, there must have been some some influence, both from certain people and also certain, let's say, certain uh, distillates and certain whiskies that uh, that have been sort of in your uh, uh, your your work history. So, can you just maybe talk about um, uh, what's what's been the major influences, either in uh, uh, in in certain people or certain whiskies that have sort of shaped uh, your technique and your style? Yeah, well, I, I was very fortunate that uh, I came uh, from the Agio. So when I had actually finished chemical engineering in, in Scotland, I applied to the Agio and was lucky enough to come on board with them. Now, the Agio at the time had 27 Scotch malt distilleries. Uh, and there was just as the, the, the thoughts of Reside were coming online. And I got my first placement with them in a place called Elgin. So I had obviously studied in Glasgow. And for a minute, I thought, oh, well, that's okay. Elgin's about half an hour from Glasgow. Then I realized I was confusing it with Erskine. 
and Elgin's actually what I would class as almost Scandinavia. So up I went to the very north of Scotland and worked from the technical centre up there at Morning House. So that was that was excellent because what it allowed you to do was work in basically any of the malt distilleries because everything was serviced from Morey House. And it I, I you know I, I remember two distilleries very distinctly when I walked into. One was Mortlock and the other was getting across to Isla. Uh, when we actually didn't think we would make it in, I'm, I'm sure if anyone who's flown from Glasgow to Isla knows, the plane, instead of coming in like this, will come in like this, almost at its side, because of the winds and you're in such a little propeller plane. But I remember I'm going to Kalila distillery there and sitting in the, 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 the managers, the head the seller's office and we were looking over Jura and we were sharing a dram and Kalila again it's all the great thing about whiskey it's all about invoking memory it's about invoking good times yeah it must it must taste good but if you've got a great liquid that invokes those memories of when you first tried it that's when you're on to a special whiskey and you know to this day Kalila the Stiller's edition and things like that I just I just love. I know Lagavulin is one of the classic malts, but for me, you know, whether it is that sentimental thing, that's a spirit that really got my attention. Then you flip to Mortlock, you know, which is in, you know, uh, Dufton there. I can see someone got the, the correct, or in fact, it's yourself, the correct name. <laughs> but, you know, seeing something like that and the wee witchy and how that operates, you know, it's, you know, Mordlick isn't, it's not a Blair Athol on the tourist route. It's not a, a Cardew or a Glen Ord. But when you go into those distilleries, uh, you know, it gets your mind going and the smell of a malt distillery, that's just when you fall in love with it. So that that was a great thing. I was then lucky enough to work actually in a maltings at Burghead. Uh, we actually acquired Bush Mills. When I was with Diageo and I was lucky again that I was asked to go for a Martin Bush Mills, which was another great thing because you were seeing, uh, although we were under the Diageo head, you could see the difference in opinion between the Scottish employees and the guys back here in Ireland. And they just didn't put Irish whiskey on the map at all. You know, they just, simple as that. For them, Scotch was it and that was it. And, as being someone from this part of the world, that immediately made you think, well, hold on a second, you know, we can distill just as well as you guys can. And that probably drove me on then to do my diploma in distilling. So it was it was very, very nice to have to go up in front of all my peers and colleagues to pick up the uh, Worshipful Company of Distillers Award in front of them all as an Irishman in Glasgow. So that that's the sort of things that get you into the, the, in, in the whiskey and Yes, I went on then to Africa in beer, but it's just not the same. You know, for me, beer is a factory. I used to say that to the Guinness guys all the time. You know, it's a factory. A malt distillery is something completely different. So when the chance came to essentially, you know, do everything that I'd ever done in the whiskey uh, industry, as I say, Diageo was excellent, gave me so much uh, experience in different places from maltings right through the malt distilling, grain distilling, blending, warehousing, scourging, uh, packaging, and then the opportunity came to do all of those things on my doorstep. So it was just, you know, it was a, it, it was a dream job, uh, and I feel very privileged to be here. Um, but yes, that's those, those initial those initial uh, years in malt distilling in Scotland. That that was it. It, it just it, it drove me to, be, to to want to be in this industry. Um, Incredible. You know, lucky for me, as I say, this distillery came along because if it hadn't, you really, you know, you were probably looking at staying with the Diageo and trying to go back to Scotland, which I didn't have any interest in, in doing. I wanted to be back at home and live most of my adult life, you know, in Scotland and Africa. Uh, and I wanted to come home. So, yeah, it was great to, to get this opportunity. Incredible. Aaron, are you far from your hometown there? Not at all. So it takes me. I'm from County Down myself. So we're we're at we're at Balna Hinch and about 
10 miles down the hill there, you're you're in towards Belfast. And I just come from, from the east of Belfast there, uh, a place called the Donald. Again, very Scot- Scottish ring to it as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so it takes me probably now where I, where I live now, 15 minutes to, to come in here to work. The dream. That's incredible. I mean, anybody should be so lucky to uh, live as close to that, uh, to where they work, but but then also to actually uh, absolutely love what you're doing. I mean, that's uh, that's incredible. So uh, so well done. Uh, good job. Cool. Cheers. The thing I the thing I always think about it because truth be told, I didn't see I didn't see this job advert. It was actually a colleague of mine in Diageo, and he came up with the advert. I think it was in the. Uh, IBD magazine and he put it down in front of me and he said is that not every job you've ever done for us over in Scotland and bush mills and things and when I read it I thought yes it is <laughs> and something that you have to go and ha- have a go at from as I say from building the distillery to right through to operating and everything like that it's great. That's incredible. Um, we'll, we'll get into the the peated expression shortly but I wonder um, was it your experience that kind of uh, led the introduction of a, a peated single malt, which of course, I mean, um, I think there, to my knowledge, there's there's three peated Irish malts. There might be another one, but uh, uh, w- was that the influence to creating that expression? Well, again, you know, a lot of credit has to go to, you know, Michael and the team and everyone that was here because, you know, again, we, we wanted to create our own story and we wanted to be bringing bold character and flavours. And for me and the guys here, we, we just couldn't get to grips with why Peter is seen as a non-Irish entity. Because, you know, we love, we all love Peter. I mean, it could be, you know, my favourite expression of the time collection here. And, you know, if you go back far enough before coal was ever used, People would have been drying malted barley over here with peat also as a fuel source. And, you know, there's a reason why it stayed on the islands in Scotland because railways didn't go out there and deliver coal. So I'm very much of the opinion that you know if you, if you go back far enough, most if not all whiskey would have been uh, peated because it was the, the fuel source of the time. So how do you kiln dry? Uh, when that's your main fuel source, well, that's exactly what you do. So we we are you know absolutely behind getting peated going on here. I can't wait to get the peat rig in the still house. Uh, <laughs> you know, even when we just bottle, we, our bottling line is just over my shoulder down on the bottom floor, and I love walking in even when we're just bottling peated. Uh, you know, it fills it fills the entire distillery, uh, and it's, again, it's those. That's what whiskey's all about, invoking memories, feelings that I said, senses going overdrive, and it, it certainly does that. Incredible. Uh, I look forward to trying that, but we'll uh, we'll save that for the last. Now, um, before, I guess I'll, I'll pull up that uh, uh, that little slideshow in a minute, but what uh, what should be next? I have, uh, I have this 9010 blend with uh, an Amarone... I guess uh, a cask. That's uh, one I have here. Yeah. And I have the 2002 uh, lug tub, which yeah. is eight, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And then I've got the 2016 uh, stout. So what uh, what should we try next? I would probably go like that. That's probably the highest. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So I, I would probably go with the Amarone, then the blood tub. And then into the last one, which is the stout Stout. finish. Because it just has, again, just going sort of light. So we'll we'll try the 12-year-old Amarone. Excellent. So I'll pour that. And uh, can't wait. I mean, this is incredible. And uh, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you also to... um, uh, to Craftwork Spirits, uh, I, this 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 event would not have happened without them. So a huge thank you uh, to those uh, to those pair that I think are absolute. Um, what can I say? Beacons of of all all great things whiskey and spirits uh, in Canada and beyond. 
And Mark, can I just say again, by, rec by way of reference, this, uh, we do these tastings, Aaron and I and Jamie, our colleague, we do them all over, for all over the world. But this is the first time anywhere in the world that the Blood Tub, the Amaroni, uh, have joined with the new beer finish. Yeah. This, uh, this, uh, this is unusual. This hasn't happened before, that they've all been in, in one lineup because uh, the new the products we're trying now are only innovations, which we, we, we took a long time to decide that they were really so outstanding that they're going to become they're going to become uh, brands. But this is the first time that they've all been in, in one lineup yeah. in one tasting. Well, I'm uh, lucky. Yeah, I'm I supremely lucky. Michael, Michael talked me through the lineup for this. I said, well, "Where do you get those samples from?" <laughs> <laughs> the the blood tub, in a, in a, you know, if anyone knows a blood tub, you know, it's a it's a small. 40 liter cask. We have one with our 18 year old in it, and you have a sample. So when we were I, coming, when we I'm were speechless. Coming, I'm the, speechless. The guys were thinking we would actually have something to compare with them because we don't have it here. And I said, "Well, I'll just correct you because I have that in my office." <laughs> and that's, it. So that's it. Incredible. Uh, now, the very first thing that I notice with this uh, Amarone. Uh, whether that's a, a full maturation or a finish, is it's got that that lovely kind of pink uh, pink esque tinge. So it, it comes off as uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's not pink. It's still a, a little bit amber. So it's kind of like a peachy color, which yeah. is just so attractive. Yeah. And uh, lovely. I mean, I th think I think Amarone is a, a very underused uh, underused oak for for whiskey and i think a lot of this distilleries really want to try and incredible that uh, that you're playing with that already so that's fantastic but uh uh tell me a little bit more about uh, please, please pardon me i'm i'm so excited I, I can barely speak please tell me a little bit more about this one yeah so we actually had the opportunity to uh acquire some casks uh some amaroni casks from northeast italy and Given what we were speaking about earlier, that we're we're in we're in a position right now where we have source liquid, and I briefly touched on it earlier. I don't want to put all our new make down in bourbon casks and then worry about doing something with them in years to come. The whole inventory of our new make should be in and fully maturing in specific woods to different proportions, so that you're always able. To pick and blend and choose that's the, that's the beauty of, of doing that with your new make so anytime we had a, a you know a chance to acquire some quality casks we now have the chance with source liquid to put it in and see the influence that it'll have so i mean this one the amarone 100 will play a part in what we do in the future because you know when we when we first got this out and sampled it even after just a few months we knew something special was happening and what it does, it brings in those lovely, you know, with sherry, you have those darker fruits, but with the, the Amarone, there's like a lovely plum and cherry that can come off it. So light uh, and just. Even like a cherry blossom and uh, almost like a, I mean, like a pink, there's a pink, I mean, you can't smell salt, but there's a, there's a slight salty. Um, like, uh, you know, if you go, if you go to Japan, um, or China or Korea, there are, there are candies, uh, and confections that are not what you would expect. They've got, uh, they've got spice to them. They have salt to them. So I'm getting this slight, um, sort of like a, a, a salty, um, cherry blossom and, and cherry kind of a note to this on the nose. Yeah. That's it. And. And you mentioned salt, you know, there, there, there's other whiskey characters there that always evoke salt as well. Uh, you know, so, sometimes uh, people are forever saying if they've tasted something from the sea, they can taste the salt. You know, that comes from other character initiators in your brain that's bringing that. The salt is not, you know, 
penetrated the cask, mm. but it's that, and that's what's lovely about some of those flavors that you're tasting. The palate is Fresh. incredible. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's it's sweet at the same time as as it's tart, so it's really um, it really just tickles your whole palate, and um, really lovely. Also, the finish is uh, exceptionally lovely. Um, I've got to try more of this to actually put words to what I'm saying. Cheers, guys. Well, this this again, you know, uh, th that has really ticked the box for us. Um, you know, whether it be in this. Uh, variant, but Amaroni cast certainly will play a part in our maturation uh, profile of our spirits going forward uh, because we've loved just the way that has, has come out and I, and I can't wait to see you make an Amaroni, I can't wait to maybe see some of our own spirits and potentially even younger spirits when we're maturing, then going to an Amaroni, etc. All of that now, that door will be opened up. Um, just just as, you know, as with the Sherry there we talked about earlier on. I actually have a container of sherry casks coming from Hareth as we speak uh, because I want to put some of our new make into those, have full maturations in them. And that's what I mean about this percentage. Yes, the bulk will be the ex bourbon, then we'll be sort of hand picking other parts that really become the DNA of Hinch so that we can draw from our single malts into this something that's distinctly hinge. Hmm. I think really, really smart. Now this is obviously stronger than uh, the other three. What what kind of ABV are we talking here? This would be like 52? It, it might depend on the sample that you've actually been sent. Hmm. It, it could be anything from cask strength. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, it, it's really quite, uh, quite, quite potent and of course oh, it's, it's yes. absolutely lovely uh whatever strength this is it's fantastic um so we'll see what uh what the story is and a, a huge thank you to uh to graham young for uh for supporting whiskey whistle through this uh amazing live stream with you gentlemen so thanks a lot uh, to greg i really appreciate that that's uh very kind of you uh that'll uh, that'll go towards uh future uh whiskey whistle glassware i think i think i'm going to be doing the tua with uh, my logo on it at some point because i think if you're going to be if you're going to be enjoying irish whiskey you've got to use an irish whiskey glass i feel and i'm really glad that you guys are also behind uh the the tua uh whiskey glass so that's great i'll wait to see what uh what yarka and greg say about the strength of this there's no mention of it on this little uh, little label it mentions the the fill date and the sample date, um, but uh, not uh, not the strength. Yeah, uh, but so we're, we're we're drinking the cask strength also, and from memory that was around fifty four. Fifty four. Okay. Yeah, and my guess is is that we're we're enjoying the same strength, um, but when you add water, it's really interesting because uh, it really invokes invokes it really uh, accelerates a lot of uh these these cherry blossom and uh subtly suddenly um uh, salty notes that are coming through on the nose for me and uh like raspberry and lemons and um a, a little bit of um what spice am i thinking of here um cardamom cardamom it's got that slight like lemony and sweet edge to it yeah, which is uh, yeah. but again this is something that we you know when we're talking about strengths of spirits you have the cast strength there because that's that was the sample we drew and we were putting it out like that but again that's not to say that we would we would actually release it cast strength i know in certain parts there's a real furore about oh everything should be cast strength but you just you just hit the nail on the head there. As soon as you've dropped in some some water there, you open up something else. Mm. You know, it, it, it's chemistry. That's you know, some things are more soluble in water, some are less. Yeah, so you, you would know, of course. That's yeah. entirely I mean, um 
It, it, it's an argument sometimes that I, you know, when I hear, oh, everything should be at cast strength. But I think, well, then, you know, you're not, you're not really, in, you're not really developing into what the, the spirit can be itself because well, some are definitely better with water. Absolutely. And, and some, some are. And it also, I mean, there's a, there's a, 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 an inherent problem with, uh, with that in that, you have no idea what kind of water the uh, the consumer would be proofing the the whiskey down to their desired strength with. It could be tap water, uh, which contains fl- uh, too much fluoride or yeah. other minerals. Um, it could be uh, it could be a, a very mineral rich spring water, which which will um, uh, maybe soften it to to a degree that that uh, you hadn't initially desired. So for me, that's an issue is that, um, I mean, cask strength is amazing, but how, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you teach people? I mean, I, I know that the whiskey community is, is behind this, but the type of people that are, that are watching here today, like, uh, like Welsh Toro and Graham Young and, and Jason and myself, um, uh, Greg and Yarka and everybody else that's here uh, and that are watching after the fact, you're watching whiskey reviews and uh, live streams on YouTube. You are a whiskey nerd. You're a whiskey geek, and nobody in in the general population will understand what you're doing, and they will never do it themselves unless you are with them all the time. So it's a really hard thing to try to try to uh, to get everybody on board with this. So I I don't know. I mean I love cask strength, but I also I really appreciate. When a distillery says we are we are proofing this to what we think is ideal, um, so uh, try that. Please try it neat, and uh, you know, and then I guess that there'll have to be lots of uh, uh, lots of virtual events like this where uh, where you're helping people kind of pick up the curve uh, to learn what uh, what they need to learn so that they know that okay maybe just regular tap water isn't the best. Anyway, that was a very long soliloquy. Uh, I'll send that over to you and have you comment on that. Yeah, well, well that's it. You know, it, it really is the responsibility of the distillery, the distiller, their, you know, their blender to be tasting the spirit because really what you've got to do is you've got to make a judgment. And trust me, because what you your personal feel isn't always what is correct, but you know you have enough you have enough sensible minds, t- uh, noses, tastes around you that you're able to rationally go through and, and decide on really what you aspire to bottle that you know on, on a sort of it's it's not quite the same but a way to sort of put it put it in the picture is when we get new make coming off the stills we don't we don't all go around the, the spirit receiver take a sample nose taste and think whoa what's you know that's it you know. You, you bring it down with water, and really you should be nosing and t- at twenty percent, and that is because at that sort of level, different things will come out, and off notes specifically come out at that. So when you're if you're nosing at you know seventy percent, or even you go down to fifty or whatever, you might pick up something that when you go to twenty is quite relevant, and all of a sudden you think you're putting out good spirit, and it, you know you're not because it's masked. Well, on the other side of that, when the spirit has matured, there are things coming there that may not even be coming out into the nose until you put a little bit of water into it. There's things you could be masking. There's things that you really want to put out there. So it really is, it's, it, it's, it's down to you to, to really put that due diligence in. And when you've went that long and hard to produce the spirit, I think it's only right you give it the time and, and individually select what that proof should be that you put it out at. I think I am fully with you there. And I think, uh, I think everybody can understand that. I mean, I certainly respect um, distilleries like, uh, like Kavalin in, um, in Taiwan uh, who focus a lot on, on uh, high proof cask strength releases. But um, I've, I've tried them side by side with uh uh, their their multi cask forty six percent or fifty four percent and it's uh, 
uh, I think I think that um, as a as a nerd, I love trying the different single casks, but I also really appreciate having something that is um, uh, absolutely ready to serve, ready to enjoy that you can serve to a guest and uh, there be no kind of, oh, this is too strong. It's oh, ready yeah. to go. And it really presents the distillery, I would say, in a, a wonderful light. And then after that, okay, now you've tried the, the 46% or the 43%. This one's a bit stronger. So take smaller sips and see if you like it. I think that's a great way to approach it. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, love this Amarone. This is just Incra uh, it's crazy. I was gonna say it's crazy and incredible, and I said in in crazy. So, <laughs> anyway, and in crazy whiskey. Hmm. Now, do we have time to try the others? Uh, I'm not sure what your timeline is like. We've we've passed the hour. We're at an hour fifteen. So uh, I'll, I'll ask you uh, what your time is like. I don't want to take too much of your St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, so we, we have another 10 minutes. We have another 10 minutes. 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, so yeah, probably, need, probably need to stop. We, we'll try and stop digressing and the other things and maybe just talk with me, these ones. But yeah, I think the next one you want to try is the, uh, the blood tub. The yeah. blood tub. Okay, we'll give that a go. Honestly, I'm, I'm not even. I don't even know how you've got it, that sample genuinely, uh, because no one got no one got a sample. Yeah, I feel very lucky again. I mean, yeah. this is crazy. So this is an 18 year old in a blood tub, which is a smaller type of cask. You mentioned, uh, is it 50 liters? I think you said. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if you get the color differential here but basically the large bottle i have on the right was the 18 year old and this smaller bottle was after being in the blood tub for only six months so wow just on the color but on the nose if you have the 18 year old beside you as well the difference in, in the nose now that sample and that's how i know how, how rare they are that was actually taken last year that liquid is still in that blood tub. Oh my God. <laughs> we actually, we have a sample and that's, it's a hundred mil sample coming to the distillery uh, because obviously our warehouse is getting built at the minute. So we don't, we have to keep our cask off site. Uh, so we're, we're getting a, a sample drop to, to bring up because that has now been in the blood tub for 14 months. What you've got was in for six. So, so I really want to try that, uh, the, whatever you've got now, I want to try that because what I'm smelling here, which is in, uh, just amazing for me, uh, with my Danish heritage is that I'm getting some amazing licorice, uh, coming off of the nose here, like insane licorice. It's like, it's like the, uh, uh, not your typical, uh, uh, licorice that you get in Canada or USA. This is like European great amazing licorice that uh that makes you stop and and enjoy and sit and chew your yeah. your licorice for a while it, this is really impressive yeah so i think that, i think uh that will also be uh that's at 56 percent again if you've taken the sample from which i know probably michael took yeah from my from my own ball <laughs> so that, that will be at, at, at 56, but again, e even, at, even at 56, it's not like it's a, an alcohol burn or anything, but I'm sure when you, when you put some uh, water in there, again, it'll, it'll open up. But amazingly fruity, uh, it's got um, a, like guava and uh, uh, some different tropical fruits, a little bit of papaya, um, some... Um, uh, some some very very ripe, like white peach, and then this interesting licorice that's woven through. Yeah. So this 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 tub was actually uh, this blunt tub was actually constructed from uh, a sherry cask. It had Oloroco sherry in there for eight years before it was basically deconstructed 
and made into the, a blood tub specifically for us. It was a, it was it literally was a, a one off from uh, some friends we'd, we'd met at um, I think it was Dublin. It was Kiwi Live. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't do that this year. But you know, they they put it so it's French oak, and again, you know what what you're tasting there was six months in. What we're going to have here up at the distillery will now be 14 months in, and you know we can't wait. <laughs> You've got a bit of an interrupt. <laughs> I've got a visitor. <laughs> okay, head on out, head on outside. I'll talk to you later, sweetie. <laughs> oh, she's five, and she's go she's a just a gorgeous, wonderful little human yeah. being. And I love her, yeah. but uh come in and help some. Oh, this is just amazing. I think this is uh this is really hard, I think, for for any distillery in the world to match what you've got going on here. Um recently I had some uh some Bushmills 21 year old at a friend's, and um I I would sooner have this in my my glass than that. And I know that you work there, uh, so you know. I think you can appreciate what I'm saying. Is this is just yeah. mind-bogglingly good? Yeah, yeah, it is stunning. It really is. Well, yeah. I mean, again, it's it, we're not we're not hiding behind anything here. So you know, if you if you get your thinking cap on and you think if that's an 18 year old uh, single malt, where that potentially could have come from on the island, there's things there. But what we're what we're saying is, you know, between what the liquid was before it went into that cask and what has come out afterwards it's night and day you know it's just added something so special um so yeah really really pleased with that one and that when we, i can't wait to try it and then that could be something quite exclusive because we're talking 50 bottles potentially wow so, um, if Take out the five for myself, five for Michael, two for me. You're, you're, you're talking, you're down to 40 or... Wow. Else, if, so. if, uh, if if Greg and Yorker happen to bring any into Canada, then I, I will absolutely put a bottle of, of that uh, uh, that uh, blood tub into one of my Winnipeg Whiskey Club events, right. which which I think I think it would be mind-blowing for people. So I think that's, uh, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Um, Love it. I'm, I'm going to give this a, I mean, it's just a little sample, but I got, I got to kiss this. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, maybe, but just before you, you, uh, you, you go, um, I'd like to just try a little bit of the peated single malt with you and we'll just have a little bit of a toast and then, uh, and then say, uh, say so long, uh, to you gentlemen. No problem. We'll, uh, we'll keep the, uh, we'll keep the Imperial stout finish for another day. Sounds good. Um, but I think I did see a question asking, would it be available in the UK? And the answer would have been yes to that. Yeah, so the the, the, the beer finish is actually going to be in the UK um, next month. So it's it's going to be bottled and ready for sale in Ireland and the UK in April. Amazing. Uh, well, yeah. that's great to hear. I it's can't so find that comment, but uh, you mentioned it, so that's super. So this uh, this peated single malt, forty three percent, and uh, uh, I mean it's it's quite nicely peaty. Yeah. So the malt itself would be about fifty five parts per million yeah. phenol level. And that's of course when it comes to the distillery, uh, and then basically how you distill, how you treat that will determine how much of that phenol level that comes through, but. What I like about uh, this spirit, and it's exactly what we'll be looking for here, the same high level of phenol on the malt itself. But, you know, I talked earlier about my love of Kalila and things like that. Right. Again, I think uniquely with what we have behind me here, the triple distillation allows you to come, I think, out with medicinal levels of phenol and brings you much more into that smoked cheese smoked meats which for me is just so much so much more welcoming uh you know even on the nose yes there's a lot of peat there but when you then go on the palate hmm. there's just 
there's something just so lovely and subtle and warming about it. It's not like the embers of a, of a bonfire that some can be. Yes, you do, you do get that taste, but in and around it, there's, all, there's also sweetness. You really can pick out the other characteristics in there as well. Uh, you know, like the citrus and things like that. So, lovely. You mentioned smoked cheese, and I absolutely get some interesting, like, smoked Gouda on the nose of this. And the palate, you're right. It, it's it's very subtly peaty at first, but when I when I hang that in, uh, hang on to that in my mouth for, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds on the palate, the the peppery peaty smokiness really builds, which I think is uh, I think that's yeah. what that's what peat lovers really enjoy is is uh, is the crescendo of, of smoke as you uh, as you chew on uh, on your whiskey. Yeah. Mark, if, if anyone remembers uh, the Connemara version of it, was called Turf Moor, which in, in, in English from the Gaelic is Big Peat. Mm. So Turf Moor, which was heavily peated, it was very young. That was in my Pooley days. And commercially, my goodness, we sold that everywhere. And it was uh, people who loved peat, in particular Islay Scotch, came into that in big numbers. So that's why commercially we were very interested in seeing could we do uh, could we get something similar going? And it's something that, obviously, with this type of whiskey now available, Aaron will be, no doubt, beating the high bar that this kind of whiskey creates for us. But hmm. uh, very interesting and and stands up alongside uh, Islay Scotch whiskeys all day long, I think. Absolutely, it does. Um, one question that that a lot of uh, a lot of people have who are aware of the nuances between Scotland and Ireland, um, the question that they have is. Um, is this uh, is this Irish turf, or is it Scottish peat that's used to dry this malt? No, so we we are again we're in quite a unique position here in the north of Ireland in that uh, any any of the malt that I that I acquire for the distillery will come from UK or Ireland. We're in a unique point here in the north of Ireland. We're part of the UK, but of course we're part of Ireland. So. I always say that our malt should always be the best quality that we're looking for. You know, I, I, I totally understand other distilleries when they say it has to be Irish malt, but I am more from a, you know, it, well, it has to be quality first. And if there's something that just doesn't go happen or go well in an Irish harvest, then, you know, you, you, you're maybe getting something else. So especially when it comes to peated malt, peated malt, very specific, has to be done right. And again, you know, traditionally, you will see more of that peated malt being created in the likes of Scotland or the north of England. Uh, so I'll always source for, first and foremost, who can give me the best malt. So it could be Irish, it could be from the UK. We'll keep, obviously, everything we'll keep between those, but that is solely dependent on sampling, seeing what is out there, and making sure you're getting the best malt for the spirit. And it's amazing that this is the uh, this is the lightest of the range. So uh, obviously there's 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 no color added here. Um, that's quite a pale color, and uh, for me uh, for me of course that's a mark of uh, of a real uh, real uh, integrity minded distiller. Yeah, well, well, that's it. I mean, it's single malt. Uh, single malt sits at the for me. That's why I'm passionate about this place being a single malt distillery. It's it's. Top, it's the top of any whiskey. Uh, again, I totally, you know, respect everything that's done in Ireland, especially around pot still. But for me, single malt is, you know, the high ball. It is for me the creme de la creme of whiskey. Uh, and I don't think there's enough of it in Ireland. I don't think we have enough of it to be honest. So it's absolutely right that. Again, totally in keeping. When I put and spur it out from the distillery in four, five, six years' time, people aren't expecting to see it chocolate coloured. Uh, you know, that, and that's something that will develop with, with good wood management and for the older spirits. But for now, absolutely, we want people to taste as is. It's a young spirit, but just taste what that brings. Uh, and again, it really flies the flag for young young spirits and i think if you're a new distillery then 
absolutely you must be flying that flag because it's what you're going to be bringing out to consumers first, allowing them to try it, and then see your progression through the years. No, it's really uh, uh, quite a quite a lovely peated whiskey. It's really amazing. Um, something that I would absolutely want to throw into a lineup of of uh, uh, Isla single malt peated whiskeys, and um, you know, there's uh, there's a, a couple of companies in Canada and USA that are also doing uh, peated expressions, and there's uh, peated whiskey from from India. So I think this would really fit in nicely with. Um, with that sort of an event. And I think it'll open up the, the door to people to think, hmm, there's some great peated whiskey from Ireland too. So this is just fantastic. Uh, hats off to you gentlemen. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna share one final screen here. And I, I apologize, we've had such a great chat that I haven't been able to uh, sort of manage the uh, uh, the photos that I wanted to share. But uh, this is a picture of, uh, of your gin that, uh, that I'll just pull up. Uh, let's see here. There it is. And um, if uh, if you could uh, maybe just tell me a little bit about uh, uh, this particular gin and um, uh, what's unique about it, and and then I think we'll we'll say uh, uh, again, Happy St. Patrick's Day, and close out our event. But uh, what um, what's unique about this uh, this gin for for people that are that are interested in in uh, in in gin and uh, creating cocktails with gin and so on. I think it's only fair that we pass this one to Michael because he actually was one of the fine creators of the of the actual liquid, the recipe, and everything like that. So I think I'll give him his place on this one. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, just very quickly because I know we're wrapping up, but. Uh, it was myself, um, actually my brother-in-law, Michael Stewart, and our marketing director we mentioned earlier on, Derek Cardi. It was primarily his baby, but we came up with the recipe by playing around with uh, the botanicals. And we, we had one eye actually on the North American market where we, we were sure that a juniper heavy gin wouldn't do. Uh, so we went more down the citrus route. Um, Lemon verbena was one of the one of the really new to me botanicals that we brought into the mix, um, and we, we we played with the with the botanical mix, juniper low London dry style, and the rest is history. In twenty twenty, fact, the ninth wave of gin, starting with that gold medal that it won at the uh, Gin Awards in London, is the world's most awarded gin twenty twenty. That's that's true. So. It just goes to show my, my wife's right when she says, maybe I'm a bit too fond of gin <laughs> because it shows we know what we're doing. And uh, yeah, it was one of the reasons why, of course, with our gin still here, uh, that recipe is, is now going to be coming straight out of our own stills, which we, we're, we're commissioning in the next four that, weeks, I think. Yeah, so those, that still will actually be, we're doing water distillations this week. Uh, and then we'll be moving on, and we have our botanic botanicals here. Uh, we have all of uh, everything we need to go. So we're hoping we have success with water commissioning this week, and then we progress on. Uh, and then again, we can we can repatriate, if you like, the production of uh, Ninth Wave into our own distillery. That is an incredible story, and. Uh... You know, I only have one single gin review in my, my archives uh, from a, a local producer called Two Brewers. So I'll be very happy to uh, to try and present and maybe create a, a cocktail or two with your gin at some point. And I think that's a, a, a great uh, moment to, uh, to and for me, uh, again, I have to say uh, St. Patrick's Day and to actually have uh, a distiller from Ireland at their distillery on my channel is is mind blowing, and I'm just so thankful for you, gentlemen, to have uh, given me the time uh, for this. And uh, again, a big thanks to uh, Greg and Yarka, uh, the importers of uh, of your 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 whiskey here in Canada, uh, in Craftwork Spirits. A big thanks to them. But um, well, I think I think I'm going to give you a big send off with this interesting blood tub, and just say a huge, huge thank you. Uh, hats off to you, and I wish you all the best in your uh, your upcoming 
uh, uh, distillery workings and all of the casks that are coming out. Godspeed to your stills. Let's hope that uh, that you're able to uh, uh, to get out as uh, as many as possible so that you can. Um, you know, I think I think everybody knows you've got to you've got to use your own your own juice so that you minimize the costs of of your production. So let's hope that all all that goes really well for you in the next few years. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Mark. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Yeah, so I really awesome. appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. We'll see you for the next event. And um, I will probably, I might actually just do another quick little uh, live stream with uh, with these whiskeys alone and let these gentlemen have uh, the rest of their evening. Uh, good luck to you. And uh, we'll see you again very soon, uh, Michael and Aaron. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.